There I was, a little less than two years ago, obsessively recommending things I liked to a friend while dangling from the branches of a redwood tree. Oh, how things have changed. For you see, twas on that fateful day as I was expressing my love of creative superpowers, fun characters, and absurdly long works of fiction that my friend changed my life forever, speaking words I still repeat to each new acquaintance I encounter. Hey, uh, have you heard of Worm? Truly, words that set me on a path to victory. Yet they were not alone, for soon they would be followed by one and a half million more, and that's only with one degree of causality. I haven't even gotten into all 99 hours of We've Got Worm, the millions of words that comprise Twig and all of Ward up to this point, all 165 and a half hours of We've Got Ward, and the behemoths that are Megafire's essays. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Worm absolutely captivated me, really drew me back into reading for the first time in years, happily supplanting schoolwork and responsibilities. I wanted to do more than just read the thing, I wanted to send my friend a kajillion messages about it, to draw the characters. Did I know how to draw? No! Did that stop me? No. I started branching out, finding Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere and quickly rediscovering the J-Maniac that blow through a Harry Potter-sized book every single day. I was a maladaptive daydreamer throughout my childhood, so I've been making up stories since before I could read. A process which involved running or walking in circles for hours, mouthing dialogue and making weird sound effects with my mouth. But writing them down was something I never had the patience for until I was looking at words on the screen that engaged and inspired me. With any other book, it's all right there. It's got a fancy cover, it's in another unreachable, unrelatable league. But here, I could see a story being told right in front of me, even if I was looking six years into the past, and that meant I could do it too. Now, after two years of relentlessly honing my technique, I consider myself more of a benadaptive daydreamer. At some point during the month or two it took me to get through Worm, the need to engage with it surpassed the time I could spend staring at a computer, and I went looking for an audiobook. I clicked something called We've Got Worm, and as Matt and Scott's now familiar voices filled my ears for the first time, I was struck with a profound realization. This isn't an audiobook. But for some reason I kept listening, and I'm so, so happy I did. If Worm didn't change my perspective on its own, the methodical, observant, mostly mature analysis and discussion that the Doof Squad brought to the table was exactly the push it needed. I was 16 when I read Worm the first time, barely older than Taylor herself. So like many readers, I was dragged along for her ride, her rules and justifications without much of a second thought. Until, through the incredible power of life experience, being an adult, and reading better, Matt and Scott were able to elucidate parts of the story that I completely overlooked, and prime me to read more closely as I totally overtook them and finished the book a day before Ward was announced. As unfair as it may or may not have been, Scott's brutal takedown of a 16-year-old's life philosophy was a real kick in the pants to certain listening teenagers. Confronting all the nuance I'd missed the first time around forced me to take another look at the way I was writing people. In fact, I'd never realized just how much I didn't understand about the stories I was reading, fundamental theories of writing that were missing from my toolbox, until someone was using my love of a story to teach them to me. I started taking notes. I looked for more podcasts and found writing excuses featuring that Brian Sandstorm guy from earlier, and so-called writers, another doof cast that's currently on hiatus until King Killer 3 comes out. With my new toolbox, I dove into writing, eager to try new things and fail at them better. Meanwhile, Ward has been a constant in my life ever since it started. Twice a week, it encourages me to reflect on character, stories, and the people in my life. And at least once a month, it makes me cry tears of joy and or crushing sadness. Each of the main characters tackle issues in my life from a new angle with their stories, even if my version isn't always life, death, and superpowers. We've all felt guilt, pride, intrusive thoughts, jealousy, the need to escape by transforming ourselves into strange and terrible creatures, and petty frustration before. And here we can engage with that, sit with the feelings it creates, and come to terms with our own versions and variations, while appreciating the things that make us different. Because through its interludes and eagle-eyed podcasters, Perihumans taught me that everyone is actually just like me. And then it taught me that everybody is an absolutely unique circumstance, even if they're literal clones. That everyone has their own personal philosophy, stories they tell themselves, even the 11-year-old superweapons who are aware of that. Because of how that was demonstrated again and again, arc after arc, I can truly say I'm a better person. I started treating my own brother with more respect and consideration immediately after reading Tristan and Byron's chapters. 
because their point of view gave me a way to measure my own thoughts and actions against characters that I understood. The way I think and exist bears little resemblance to the me of two years ago. And even the things I can expect out of daily life have shifted. Each week, Scott makes a connection or observation that I never would have caught, and I'm that much more alert when I read the next chapter. Whenever I have two or more hours to spare, I spend them live reading Pact, learning to appreciate on an entirely new level. I write something new and exciting and challenging every day, and I look for the stories surrounding my every interaction. Two years ago, everyone at my school took this character strengths test to discover their best and least best positive qualities. In a completely unexpected twist, younger me was creative above all else with curiosity as a close second, and utterly abysmal at self-discipline and humility. Well, I retook that test just a month ago, and the results actually were kind of unexpected. While creativity is still high, appreciation of beauty has surpassed that as my strongest trait. I can't help but attribute at least part of that to a story that finds at least as much beauty in the most normal, wonderful aspects of everyday life as it does in superheroes, powers, and awful, gut-wrenching body horror. And as for curiosity, well, it's still up there, but recently, perspective has surpassed it. And for that, I believe I have parahumans to thank. So thank you, Wildbow. Thank you for adding your voice to discussions or live reads, for being so involved and supportive of this community, and for consistently writing things I can't wait to read. But Parahumans isn't just the work of one person to me. So thank you, Matt, for your brilliant psychological insight, iconic sense of humor, and cynical deconstruction of the vast illusion of agency. Thank you, Scott, for sharing your emotional connection with the text, the thoughtfulness you apply to your analysis, and the vehement yet endearing stubbornness with which you hold your opinions. Bird, thanks for pushing me to think just a little more about that chapter I just spent two hours thinking and writing about. And Kippos, Corona, Highlander, Peta, Justigo, Fedora Gorgon, David, and Spinagon, thanks for always showing up to discuss something way too in-depth with me. Thank you, Elliot, Ruben, Kira, Wonkith, Lexicon, Megafire, Zendrex, Torch Salesman, and anyone else who's been a part of what Parahumans is to me. I'm Jay Maniac, and I'll see you all this Tuesday.